So uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, new Armex webinar on large scale screening with the Vivo chip. We're excited to share with you the origin story of the company and two large scale studies uh, that we have conducted. I'm Dr. Gina Lento, head of operations here at New Wormix, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Today with me live are Evan Haggerty, who will, be, who will first present on the company itself, and Dr. Sudeep Mandal uh, from UT Austin, who will be presenting the studies showing the original applications of the 96 well technology. Then Evan will return with a quick sketch of our current and new product offerings. And so, like I said, it would be about uh, 10, or excuse me, 15, 20 minutes for the presentation, then we'll get into the questions. So just checking the Q&A window and the chat window, I see no questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. Evan? Thank you very much, Gina. Hey, everyone. I'm Evan Haggerty, the co-founder at New Warmix, director of manufacturing, plant-based cook, and an active musician in Austin, Texas. Let me introduce our core team. So our co-founder, Adela Benyakar, holds the Harry Kent Professorship in Mechanical Engineering at the University of Texas. She specializes in femtosecond laser surgery, two-photon microscopy, high-speed imaging, and microfluidics. And her research has been cited more than 5,000 times in scientific literature. Dr. Adam Lang is one of our senior scientists with a background in stem cell and organoid 3D culture, specializing in the use of microfluidics for high throughput screening. Dr. Gina Lento, our director of operations, has a PhD in biochemistry and has been a serial COO for life science companies for the past 18 years. Uh, New Ormix welcomes our newest team members, Dr. Jacob Moore, our automation manufacturing engineer, and Dr. Yunki Im, our molecular geneticists. Our guest today is Dr. Sadeep Mandal, a veteran C. elegans researcher at UT Austin who also serves as our scientific and technical advisor. Again, I'm Evan Hegarty, the engineering mind behind our patented microfluidic devices, and we are New Ormix. So let me tell you a bit about what we do. We use nematodes, specifically C. elegans, to test compounds in our everyday lives for neurotoxicity, developmental neurotoxicity, and developmental and reproductive toxicity. So some of you may have seen our milestones timeline before, so I won't take much time here. In 2016, Dr. Ben Yakar and I founded New Ormix. In 2017, we received the UT Innovation Award to translate the technology for commercial applications. We received our first NIH SBIR Award in 2018 to further develop the VivoChip platform. In 2019, we began academic sales, had two of our patents approved, and received a phase one SBIR for our organoid chip work. This year, we received a phase two SBIR award for the VivoChip and neurotoxicity assays. So what my colleague Sudeep is gonna to talk to you about are two studies we conducted in the Ben Yakar group using our original technology, the technology that inspired and sparked the creation of our company. So during my graduate studies at UT Austin um, with the Ben Yakar group, Sudeep and I worked closely to accomplish the following papers and technological achievements. So please take it away, Sudeep. Great. Thank you, Evan, for your introduction and also inviting me to this webinar series that has been conducted by uh, Nuomix. Um, I'm happy to present in our second in the line. So in this talk today, uh, what I will try to focus on is uh, presenting our research that was conducted uh, in Beniaka Group at UT Austin. And also this is, uh, will evolve around the story um, that has led to the development of this Vivo chip technology that we have just heard from Evan Hegarty, and you will also hear more towards the end of the uh, talk today. <clears throat> and in the in the in the uh, while this uh, presentation, you will also hear about two case studies that involved uh, screening uh, disease models using C. elegans um, uh, uh, C. elegans as a model system. So, uh, as many of you uh, who are attending this webinar might know, that C. elegans has prove, proven to be a very useful model organism for investigating molecular and cell cellular biology of numerous diseases, uh, human diseases. More recently, uh, actually increasing number of research groups uh, worldwide are exploring the use of C. elegans as a tool for drug discovery. Uh, and this is a very uh, interesting um, a move that's happening uh, all over the world. And <clears throat> these aspects are even more important when it comes to the age-dependent uh, diseases such as aging and neurodegeneration. That uh, and associated with this is the subliteral phenotypes that you sometimes have to score in these model systems. 
Now, uh, we have presented uh, three well-established cases here on this slide that you see uh, here that are marked with uh, phenotypes that are very difficult to analyze. And they require very appropriate, uh, much appropriate choice of technologies. And with this uh, comes the point that you actually uh, see now that there are uh, various studies um, which are including a few drug screens that have been performed with the elegance models. These studies were either labor intensive or were performed in low throughput. Until recently, several groups have been implementing uh, technological advancements such as high throughput liquid handling substations, imaging platforms, and image analysis softwares to automate the C elegant screens. One such technology is a plate readers. Many of, of uh, in this audience might be uh, aware of it or might already have experience using this, which can actually now go and capture large field of views and acquire warm images from individual wells. Now, you also know that there are various uh, uh, new automated image analysis software packages that are being developed that can analyze these fluorescent images, identify the phenotypes from individual animals. Now, if you think about such approaches, have led to identification of only gross phenotypes, uh, such as overall number of pixels that are uh, bright in fluorescence intensity or animal, animal length or body features. If you now uh, take a little bit more advanced um, advancement in this uh, context. Uh, Microfluidic technologies, on the other hand, has recently that has emerged and uh, been very fruitful as a potential powerful tools for high throughput analysis of the elegance. Microfluidic tools in general has been uh, very useful in delivering chemicals in a small volume. It can also help you to maintain worms, precisely manipulate these worms, and then help you to observe in, them in series. Our group has, uh, in the past, uh, as you see on this picture, has demonstrated the use of microfluidics for precise exotomy of specific neurons in worms using a femtosecond laser. And we have pioneered this field where we were able to study axonal regeneration in an anesthetic-free environment. And this itself is very, very useful and important as the field has shown. Uh, now, several other groups, uh, including ours, ourselves, have developed other microfluid technologies that have been uh, achieving high throughputs uh, that has been very useful for high throughput studies. But what they suffer from is operation complexity. Typically, you need a very uh, high end expertise to uh, be able to operate these devices. But learning from this past, we realized that there are many key design requirements that we need to consider when you are trying to develop a new technology. For example, a technology that is suitably in a multiple, uh, multiple format, uh, in a footprint that is enable, that will enable you to run many, many population at one time, at the same time. It should be amenable to liquid handling system, which should, uh, in other words, should format uh, be formatted in SBS format. It should also come with a miniaturized need for cumbersome and not to have cumbersome tubing inputs, like as you see in this picture. Now, obviously, as you know, microfluidics also have a lot of issues that needs to be figured out, like mixing, uh, how to uh, mix the uh, consumables or liquid properly, how to avoid bubbles, and on the other hand, you still want to maintain high speed and high resolution imaging. Now, say that, what we have developed at UT Austin, and I'm uh, grateful to the team of, uh, innovating team of researchers in the Beniaka group, that we came up with this nice, interesting tool uh, that has a core in microfluidic technology, and that can perform high throughput, high resolution imaging of almost like 4,000 free elegance in a very short amount of time. And this technology allows you to put the worm in a very stereotyped way so that you can now go and streamline your image analysis and perform because of this stereotype fabricated channel design. So if you think about this technology and compare what, how what we introduced in the beginning, how is it different right, from what existed? So if you imagine and compare our technology from a standard multi-well plate format, what you see in this slide uh, uh, is a well on the left-hand side up from a plate that you can Im go and image in a plate reader. Let's imagine you have put some tain worms and they are randomly oriented, but immobilized with anesthetic. Now, if you want to acquire these uh, animals in a robust manner, what you have to do is you have to take several field of view uh, with the camera images and take these images to be able to capture all, let's say 10 worms per well. So you need at least four wells to image 40 worms sufficient uh, to get statistically significant um, uh, number. Now on the right hand side, on the other hand, you see our microfluidic device called VivoChip, where you can uh, nicely align 40 worms next to each other and in a high density manner, right? So now with uh, only four field of view 
and very limited number of planes, imaging planes, you can acquire all 40 worms in one population in a given chip in one of the wells. So seeing this potential, what we decided now to move forward uh, is how does it scale up and how can we use this kind of technology for uh, running our large scale studies? So what you see here is a, a picture on the left-hand side is a vivo chip, which, has, uh, which is put on a gasket system, which helps, you to, helps the user to operate this uh, kind of chip in a very robust way, in a very simple user-friendly manner. Now, if you have a chip that is loaded, uh, as you see from the top, it looks like 96 well plate format. It's a, exactly the 96 wells where you put the worms, they go into this chip and you turn on the gasket to run all 4,000 animals, immobilize them within three minutes, all in parallel. Now, once these animals are immobilized, the entire system is then loaded on a microscope that you see on the right-hand side for fast transition, translational stage, with the fast translational stages to expedite your image acquisition. As you can imagine, our uh, we also have an automated image, imaging software to acquire these images. But if you think about the, go back and think about the chip, the heart of the chip is actually a design of microfluidics that you see on the, on the panel now on the left, is an array of 96 well, and underneath each well, you have channels that you will see in the next slide, which is an array design. Um, the one on the first eight well design, a subsection of the chip. And then if you zoom in more to one of the well, you see 40 parallel traps aligned to, in parallel where the worms can get immobilized. Uh, and then you see that we can go and acquire the images of these uh, uh, worms. Now the well channel geometries are designed to enable robust inform immobilization across the entire chip. And that's the uh, uh, core of this technology. The channels are designed in 3D tapering uh, style, reducing the cross section as we go towards the device exit to immobilize and orient worms in the lateral axis. And uh, the reason for that you will see in, in a bit in our screen that becomes very, very powerful, especially when you have low expression uh, of your protein, uh, uh, fluorescent protein. The pressure cycles are also applied in a very specific manner using a vivo cube that you will hear from Evan towards the end of the slide, our presentation, that helps us to rotate and immobilize the worms for high resolution imaging. So uh, just to give you one of our first application, uh, once you, we were able to immobilize 4,000 animals, uh, you can go and acquire these images of the animals using inverted microscope, using different light sources for bright fill or fluorescence, as you see on this slide. We have custom built uh, image analysis software pipeline to load the images, um, uh, image analysis software that uh, uh, actually software pipeline that loads these images, crop individual channels with worms, and then you analyze this worm for very specific fluorescence or bright field phenotypes. As an example, as you see on the right hand panel here, uh, and our first screen where we took the advantage of a polycule aggregation model that was developed by Morimoto's group using a muscle promoter, I've shown uh, here. So uh, as you know, uh, when you have 24 repeats of polyglutamine, the worm remains uh, soluble, uh, healthy, and with a soluble uh, YFP signal. But as you put this animal with uh, uh, 35 repeats of polyglutamine, they show uh, age-dependent aggregation in the body wall muscle cells, which you see here on, on the first panel on the right. Uh, so we, we were able to take these images in 3D, analyze them using our image analysis software, and identify each and individual aggregate within an animal and extract the information within less than 15 minutes. So given this kind of a, a scale, we now were ready to perform our large scale studies uh, for a specific drug library, as you will see in our next slide. So uh, we have uh, successfully uh, implemented this model on our platform. And as you can see a picture of uh, a pile of chips, we ran almost like 100 chips as of uh, now, where we uh, to perform, to carry out our screens using this um, kind of chips and the gasket system and our automation pipeline, we were able to identify aggregates, a number per unit length from the body, from the animal bodies, uh, from, for both healthy and unhealthy controls. With this, statist, with this parameter, we were able to achieve very high quality assay quality, uh, control with a Z factor, Z prime factor of 0 0.8. And many of you might know a value of Z prime greater than 0 0.5 which indicates that our assay performance are well above the requirement and we were ready to run the large scale screen. So we took a library of thousand FDA approved chemical, uh, chemicals uh, that we have we were achieved from our drug center to identify, to screen with this model of polyglutamine 35 animals. 
Now, when you throw these animals with this uh, drug, individual drugs, we were able to find out those class of drugs that could reduce the number of IV deaths below three standard deviation from the vehicle control, as you see in this uh, panel here, which is the gray, uh, dotted gray lines. Now, we picked almost like 17 hits out of this screen, and then we took a few of those, uh, actually four of those, and ran a dose-dependent response curve to find out to uh, find out if the hits were a positive, and we confirmed the hits as well as one of those to a surprise a dronodrome, which uh, showed a dose-dependent response in this model. Now, if you uh, are aware of this chemical, this was actually a therapy for uh, treatment of patients with arterial flutter, and we, to our surprise, we actually found that this drug, which uh, uh, is a therapeutic repurposing of the drug, was have shown efficacy in this uh, uh, model in sea elephants. Um, as a second example to uh, where we, uh, you, you can see what we have also done at UG Austin is uh, we took a model uh, with a, a cholinergic neuron model. In this case, we have a model that, was, that expresses GFP in the six cholinergic neurons, specifically VC1 to VC6 neurons in the ventral cord. And our collaborator, John Pierce, has actually created a single copy model of amyloid precursor uh, protein in the same neuronal background using a genetic tool. Now, when you took this model and uh, started comparing the wild type with the human APP version, we found, to our surprise, that there is a age-dependent degeneration of a very specific subset of neurons for, called VC4 and 5, as you see in this picture, uh, which is very close to the vulva, uh, vulva of the world. Now, when you take this to population, compare them side by side, we were able to identify a strong age-dependent degeneration in this model much early on compared to what you would do in other ways, like using a standard slide imaging. So we were able to identify a huge significant difference even as early as day three adults when you treat these animals, uh, when you put these animals in your vivo chip. And to, uh, just to uh, look into this model has also uh, have a behavioral decline as they age. Uh, and this particular degeneration is, was found to be sigma 2 uh, R receptor dependent. So once uh, characterizing this model, and uh, with our platform, the animals uh, then were treated with a novel class of uh, novel benzomorphins drug, uh, starting at F4 stage, and then imaged at the same stage as you saw in the previous slide, which is a day three age animal. Uh, if you are not aware of this chemical space, these chemicals were actually generated by our, one of our collaborators using a modular synthetic platform. To, uh, and then he took the advantage of a diverse array of substituted heterocycles and tested them in in vitro binding assays. Uh, that have led to them to find out few of those candidates, which uh, we had uh, interest to screen in using our model system. Now, the reason we did this is to increase uh, uh, the uh, to basically uh, select, pre-select some of these candidates to be taken for further studies. In order to increase the sensitivity of the assay, we even combined, combined multiple wells together that were treated with the same condition so that we can collect information from more than 40 animals. So in our studies, either we have acquired data from two wells or three wells as needed to increase the numbers much beyond 40 animals. And doing that, we were able to achieve very high sensitive assay. And our results from this kind of studies have led to significant identification of significant reduction in two of the derivatives out of uh, the many several candidates that has was later validated to be working with uh, a PGM, PGRMC1 mediated pathway, which is uh, sigma 2 receptor um, and orthologin C elements. So with this uh, two uh, studies that you he heard from today, um, I hope we could convince you that we have developed a novel high throughput, high content screening platform that we call VivoChip for C elements models. The technology, as you saw in this talk, was actually used for two large scale study, uh, screens using a polyglutamine aggregation model and an APP model in uh, C. elegans. Uh, as we saw, we screened uh, a large chemical library of 1,000 FDA-approved drug, drugs that uh, uh, was screened on polyglutamine aggregation model to identify hits, including one that also have shown a uh, high dose-dependent efficacy in, in our model. We also um, use the technology to prioritize our novel compounds, set of compounds, which are normal benzomorphins against the APP-induced neurodegeneration and helped us to do structure to relation optimization. Uh, now, if you are looking forward, uh, we are actually developing a high, ultra high density vivo chip technology to extend this to even higher density, uh, which in, uh, is actually three to four well format 
and that includes uh, almost like 12,000 worms to be screened in one chip at a time. And with this kind of throughput, we uh, believe that this uh, uh, technology will push the limit of using C elegance in such large scale screens and perform large scale screens. Uh, with that, uh, let me also thank um, a lot of our collaborators, including group members at, in Benefa Lab. Uh, we have uh, been intensively collaborated with John Pierce and Stephen Martin at UT Austin for the APP model study work and uh, for our funding research uh, organization to help us uh, to find, uh, to uh, perform the carry out these screens. And with that, I will uh, end here, but I will uh, give the platform now to Evan Hegarty, who would like to give you a little bit more towards uh, what he's heading to uh, at, for New Omics work. Thank you, Evan. Thank you very much, Sadeep. So yes, the applications of this technology were so successful and the potential so obviously large that we decided to continue refining the design into our current Neuormix Vivo chips. We now have a wide range of Vivo chips to study different age worms from the earliest larval stage through day five adult. Don't worry if you're not equipped for large scale. We have developed something very unique to meet the needs of university labs, the Vivo chip 2X. It's the exact same micro technology, but with two wells instead of 96. Our Vivo chip 2X comes with a number one glass slide, comes on a number one glass slide, sorry, has two independent immobilization devices, each with 40 trapping channels, and is compatible with inverted and upright microscopes using any magnification objective. So to run any of the Vivo chips, you'll get a Vivo cube and a starter kit, which includes all of the equipment needed to set up and run Vivo chip experiments. C. elegans not included. What is included is a live video call with instructions from a member of the Neuormix team. So we now have customers at various universities and research institutes around the world. So you can see the international reach of our products and systems. So here are some different applications that people are finding uh, using our Vivo, set, Vivo chip. Um, these are a few images taken by some of our many customers. And these images and more can be found on our customer testimonial page on our website. So the studies that Dr. Mandal discussed were done using an early design of our platform. We at New Ormix took the technology and developed it further into our commercial 96 well Vivo chip product, which we now use to conduct our own high throughput, high content assays. This enables us to offer high content toxicology screening services to provide developmental and neuro neurotoxicological endpoints using C. elegans. The high throughput screening platform enables multiple parameter and neuron specific toxicology assessments using major neurotransmitter systems. This allows our customers to gain insight into neuronal toxicology outcomes of chemicals from an in vivo model with system level information. So our ultimate goals are to protect public health by early identification of environmental chemicals with the NT potential, to prioritize industrial chemicals that require further in vivo testing, and to help industries to reduce animal use while meeting regulatory compliance. So if you wanna see some more of our work or what we've done, our application notes can be found on our website. And if you have any questions about pricing or are considering doing your own high throughput worm screens, please email us or go to our website for any further information. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we'll now go ahead and begin the Q&A session. Thank you, Sadeep and Evan. Um, we've got a few questions coming in here. Uh, one of the most common I can see right off is, um <clears throat> how long does it take uh, kind of how long does a screen take or how long does it take to image one full chip uh Sudeep, do you want to answer that one yeah sure uh, actually uh, that's a very common question that i have been hearing in many times when i'm presenting this uh, talk in conferences uh, and uh, i can tell you this it all depends on your uh, requirements of the model for example, the polyglutamine aggregation model that I screened um, 1,000 FDA approved compound library, uh, we were able to image uh, with a, a nearly one micron resolution. And it took me uh, nearly 15 minutes to image uh, all 4,000 animals in a whole entire 96 well chip, uh, 96 well chip to uh, acquire data of uh, 5,000, more than 5,000 images. So it all will depend on your screen, the requirement of imaging quality. Because if you are going for a higher resolution with a, a, a NA that requires multiple field of views, then obviously you have to scale that up. But as an example, I can tell you that our polyglutamine aggregation model took uh, 12 minutes to image the entire chip, 12 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Great. 
Thank you. Um, and here is another one. Um, I work with CRISPR worms that have a low expression. Can I still use your technology? Yeah, uh, so that's a very important point. And I can tell you it uh, has been one of our major challenge, specifically the model that we saw on the neuron degeneration model, the APP model, uh, which also had a very faint uh, uh, frozen protein expression. And on top of that, because we were looking at age-dependent degeneration, there was a subtle changes in the intensity pattern. For example, on the day three to day five animal, as you can imagine, as the neurons are dying, the degeneration, the intensity goes down and down. So the challenge that we encountered during our study was actually how do you capture such a phenotype in these worms as they uh, age, right? Or as they are degenerating. So in these models, as you can imagine, we are not looking for uh, off and on phenotype. We are looking for small changes in intensity and whether we'll be able to capture it. So uh, given that kind of uh, constraint, I can tell you that the model, uh, the platform that we have, if you have sufficient uh, intensity uh, and uh, capability to capture this intensity, our technology can allow you to orient this worm in a suitable manner so that you can see the same animal with the same background repeatedly so they can acquire and phenotype them in a robust manner. So I believe, yes, for CRISPR worms, especially those that we people are now developing for a bit of huge human relevance, that where you are doing either low expression for, uh, expression line or you have a subtle phenotype or sublethal phenotype, I think our technology can pave the way and basically you can use this to screen your model very robustly in a, in a uh, high throughput manner as well. Great, thank you, Sudeep. Um, <clears throat> Evan, I think this is uh, this next one is one that you might be able to answer. Uh, do you need customized software to acquire images from the Vivo chip? So the uh, the Vivo chip that we are selling to research institutes and university labs is that Vivo chip 2x that comes with the um, two wells, each with 40 channels. So you do not need any special software to acquire images using the Vivo chips. Um, for the Vivo chip 2X, it has a number one glass slide that you image through. So you can do any magnification objective and just use any manual or automated imaging system. A lot of people put it on confocal microscopes that do it automated, but also some people, some people don't even image and they just literally look at the worms by eye and score them directly in the chip. So the, the choice is up to you, but you don't need software for that. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, one, let's check, we might have time for one more, hang on. Um, what will be the maximal survival time of animals immobilized on the chip if the immobilization agent is not a limiting, is not a limiting survival factor? Yes, that's also a very interesting uh, point and question that we always uh, encounter in our essays. So I can, um, I can answer this uh, rather this way. So I took, uh, we took a challenge of uh, immobilizing the worm, especially the neurodegeneration model, and kept in the microfluidic device uh, the whole entire 96 well chip for many, many hours, like up to two hours, we make them every 30 minutes. And we were trying to characterize the extent of degeneration or effect of immobilization on neurodegeneration. And to our surprise, we saw no statistically significant difference in the neurodegeneration phenotype. So how long to what extent we can do is yet to be addressed. Uh, and I know that um, some, many people have been asking us if they can do up to long-term imaging, like a couple of more hours, like three to four hours or even longer. Uh, which I can tell you that from our studies, we have not performed, but we believe uh, that these worms will stay healthy up to like two to three hours, uh, provided uh, you don't stress them too much uh, with uh, other, other factors like uh, bleaching or too much of exposure. Great, thank you, Sudeep. Well, it is, uh, we've reached our 30 minute mark. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, appreciate that people have uh, schedules today and we've taken 30 minutes of time. If you are, have other questions, um, please send them in uh, via the email uh, or any of the links that you see here on the screen. The recording of this webinar will be made available. It'll be posted on our website. 
and as well as details of our next webinar to come up uh, in a few weeks, maybe April, I think. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sudeep. Thank you, Evan, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.